Kitchen here at Surfrider and our diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. And our land acknowledgement. You can take a minute to read that. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about getting our voices heard. We've been doing a lot on um, the written word and visual storytelling, but today we're going to talk more about verbal storytelling. So how do we get our voices heard in a public forum? What tools are effective for public speaking and where to even start? So we're going to first just start with the mechanics of actually submitting your testimony. Um, and Bree's going to go into that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, as we all know, things have been a little complicated uh, during the pandemic. So we'll talk about uh, normal times and also uh, pandemic times. So, of course, you can always submit written testimony to elected officials. Um, my practice is to submit both written and also to sign up to give verbal testimony and verbal testimony does make a bigger impact. Um, I think it's good to kind of go into a meeting assuming that the elected officials have not had time to actually read your testimony yet. And if you give the verbal testimony, um, whenever it's a public hearing, they're listening to what you have to say right when they're having the discussion about their decision. So it kind of sticks in their minds better. Um, and you can really hear this from the discussion that happens after public comments when the counselors are discussing the public comment that's come in. Uh, I tend to hear them quoting more from the verbal um, public testimony. And it's not to say that they don't actually read, but especially if you're submitting your testimony at the last minute, um, like a few hours before the meeting, they're really only going to have time to skim it and not spend a lot of time with it. Um, and these are some fifth graders from Sam Case Elementary that are giving uh, verbal public comment to the Newport City Council. And this kind of shows you this is the typical setup for giving public testimony, whether it's city, county, or state level. Um, if you study power dynamics, uh, this sets you up for really interesting power dynamics because usually the elected officials are actually kind of elevated up above the people who are giving presentations. So even if there were taller adults sitting there, their heads are still lower than the elected officials, um, which can make it a little more intimidating. But the cool thing is these fifth graders came to three, three or four different uh, city council meetings. And uh, most of them the first time had their note cards for giving their testimony. And by the end, some of them, like Oliver, who's on the left, um, he went up to respond and actually rebut some of the comments for people who were speaking against the plastic bag ban and was shooting from the hip and uh, did a really amazing job at really listening to the other side and then going back up and presenting um, his what he felt was really important. So he briefed. Um, yeah. Are you referring to a, a picture? Oh, I see. Sorry. I couldn't even tell that those were little kids there. They looked like adults. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah. So those, those, are, those are our fifth graders. Oh, wow. Okay. Now I see how young they looked. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, um, I wanted to show you a video, but my internet is having a fit today. And so that's not going to work. But Anna's going to put it in the blog post. 
Um, so you can actually see a video of um, the, some of the students providing public testimony. Um, but again, like we've been covering over the, you know, con connecting your legislators and sort of writing your stories that all follows a similar format. Um, there is a little more formality when you're giving public testimony. Uh, and sometimes those instructions are communicated. Sometimes they're not communicated. But when you're giving verbal public testimony, you'll start with, um, for the record, stating your name and your address. Um, and then some of the physical systems, like if you look at the student sitting on the right, you can see that he's actually touching the microphone. Uh, in some cases, you have to hold down a button for the recording system to be recording you. And if you don't hold down the button, usually a bunch of people will jump in and tell you to hold down the button. Um, and when you're signing up in person to give testimony, this is something that's universal, so it's easier. Uh, when you get to the room where you're going to give testimony, right outside of the door will be a piece of paper for you to sign up before the meeting. And so you'll look at the agenda, and um, usually they want you to reference the agenda item that you'll be speaking on. There is opportunity to give testimony on items that are not on the agenda. Um, and that's at a different time in the meeting. But if there's a public hearing, in this case for plastic bags, they ask for all of the public comments for that public hearing when they get to that agenda item. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, also time limit um, should be stated. Typically, it's three minutes. Sometimes you will literally get cut off. Sometimes they let you go a little longer. Um, for state level testimony, sometimes it can be five minutes. Um, what they'll do sometimes is see how many people are speaking and then tell you how long you have. It's usually good to just plan for three minutes and no longer than that. And practice because you don't wanna get cut off, especially if you've got like an, a really phenomenal last uh, sentence to leave them with. And just make sure you're clear in your ask. I want you to pass this ordinance. I want you to vote no on this ordinance and just be crystal clear. During COVID, things are more complicated. Um, so at the state level, their website, so this is for um, a committee hearing, on the state's website, there are clear instructions on how to give notice, that you want to give um, verbal testimony. And then it also walks you through how you can actually give your written testimony. And so you'll have to have your computer set up or your um, smartphone. And at this time, for the current legislative session, there is no in-person. So all of it is completely remote and you have to register ahead of time. So if you go to the next slide, on the city and county level, it's very, very different for each municipality. So I just pulled an example. Um, some cities have it more figured out than others. Um, and so there isn't a blanket sort of, this is how you sign up to give testimony that I can tell you for cities and counties. But I pulled this off of the Newport City Council agenda. Typically, that's where you'll find the public comment information is actually on the agenda at the top. Some cities and counties have it on their website. Again, it's just it's very specific. Um, so it's good to do research well in advance of the meeting that you want to testify at. And so from this one, you can see you just you send an email to a particular um, email address and they'll send you a Zoom link. Um, to make things a little more complicated, they don't let you into the Zoom meeting until it's time for you to give public testimony. So you need to watch the council meeting streaming somewhere else to know when they're going to call you. Um, and technology doesn't always work. 
So the last time I was giving testimony for Newport City Council, their live stream wasn't working. So I was just sitting in the Zoom waiting room for two hours and 15 minutes, waiting for them to let me into the meeting. In that case, it was actually a scheduled presentation, not public comment. But things get a little kind of like awkward and weird with the COVID, um, but everyone's very understanding and we kind of figure out those technical issues. Um, sometimes I'll have paper by, the, by your side. I was in a planning commission meeting giving public testimony and they hadn't unmuted the next person who was supposed to speak. And so through text message system, we were able to get a piece of paper held up so that the staff person running the Zoom meeting could unmute the next speaker. So it's good to just kind of be prepared to try to work through those technical issues, but it is still really, really valuable to give that verbal testimony in addition to the written testimony. Um, and so if you're, of course, if you're testifying on anything, any issues that Surfrider is working on, um, Anna and I can help support tracking down that information if you're not able to find it. That's all I have for my part. Anna, you're muted. Yes, classic. Trying to take notes and do the slideshow at the same time. Um, and Dia, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm so sorry I was late. That's okay. It happens. Um, well, we have a special guest joining us today. Her name is Gracie Schatz, and she's quite experienced in um, getting involved in local issues and public speaking. So I will let her speak for herself and introduce herself and and uh, give you a bit of a her insight into how to be effective in this realm. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Gracie. Um, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about my background and how I've gotten involved in city politics. And then I was just going to do a little, I mean, you're welcome to ask me questions if you have specific things you struggle with with public speaking, but I'll kind of go off on my spiel and you can feel free to interrupt me with questions while I'm talking. Um, so this past summer during after George, George Floyd was murdered, I became very involved in the Eugene politics, especially regarding um, our budget for our police department. And there's an organization here in Eugene called CAHOOTS, which is a crisis response, mental health crisis response team. And I started a petition to allocate some of our budget, the police budget, to CAHOOTS. And the petition gained momentum rapidly, and it over 15,000 people signed it. And so I made it on change.org. It was super easy to make. And that petition kind of catapulted me into this conversation with our local policymakers. And I started showing up at city council meetings and just paying attention to who these council people are and what they care about and what they choose to speak up about and what subcommittees they serve on and how they participate. So I started attending our police commission oversight board and our human rights committee uh, meetings and just kind of getting a feel for who these policymakers are and what they're willing to put their necks out on the line for. And I felt like that was a really effective tool in being heard is knowing who you're talking to because Council members, they, they show up to their meetings, they do a lot of work. And if somebody shows up with public comment, they've never heard of them and they're yelling and telling and demanding things, it's really easy for council people to kind of write them off. But if you show up at a council meeting and you say, council person Clark, last week you said something I really agreed with and I wanna appreciate you for that. I'm hoping that you'll stand beside me in, in fighting for this change or, you know, council person Surrett, you're my council member of my ward. You, you made this decision that was really important. Like for instance, Councillor Surrett is the, my ward's council person. She's really involved in unionizing and labor movement. She works for the nurses union. So when I'm talking about union rights or organizing, I speak directly to her. 
Um, my mother is a council person in the town where I live. And so before I started to have these conversations or show up at council meetings, I talked to my mom and I said, well, what should I do? How should I, how should I be heard? And she said, for the first, the first most important thing is to thank your council members for their work. Whether or not you agree with them, these people are showing up and they're listening and they have a lot of work behind the scenes. So just show up and thank them first and foremost and appreciate the service they're providing your community. Even if they're making decisions you don't like, there's a lot that they're doing that you don't see. So that's how I always start. Um, so getting into more of the logistics of public speaking, what doesn't work? If you've sat at a city council meeting before, you might have some input on this of your own. For me, what doesn't work is a, sort of a monotone voice or a quiet mumbling voice. If someone just has the same tone throughout their entire, um, their entire speech, you're less likely to pay attention or care. And it's easier to kind of look down, zone out, not care. I find that can be a result of having every word you're going to say typed or written out ahead of time. If you're reading from a script, it's a lot harder to have intonation and emotion expressed. If you feel uncomfortable improvising and you need to read from a fully written out statement, highlight the most important words and the most important sentences so that you can remind yourself that's where the emphasis needs to come in. But if at all possible, what I like to do is make bullet points of what I want to say and then let it kind of flow naturally as though I'm in a conversation with a friend. I've been reading a lot of Jean McAlevey. She is a union organizer who I really recommend her books. And she talks a lot about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Mobilizing is when you get people who already kind of feel the same way you do to get off their couch and do something. Organizing is when you can involve people who were not active or not paying attention in a common cause. It's when you can increase the size of your movement. And I think it's incredibly powerful to know the difference and know what it is you're trying to do. Showing up as an individual at a council meeting and saying your part is powerful, but showing up as a group and each person referring to the other person, it, it sends a bigger message. So, you know, you guys are all a part of an organization. As soon as you start, you know, speaking, if you decide to go speak together, you can speak as the organization and you can refer to each other by name in your testimony. And that tends to add a lot of strength to the testimony. Like, I wanna echo what Jean said today. I have a similar demand. And, you know, in that you're showing that you didn't just come to say your piece, you also came to listen and pay attention. So I think my first recommendation is to just go to a council meeting, to sit in and watch and listen and see who's, who's, speak, who's speaking really calls you, calls you and brings energy to you and makes you feel engaged. And, and who do you kind of zone out on? And why is it working? Why are you paying attention? Sometimes I'll notice in the council meeting, there'll be like a huge group of people that all show up with the same demands and they'll repeat the demands over and over and over again. And that is a tactic and it can be effective. But what I've noticed with council people here is when the same demands are repeated ad nauseum, they'll kind of stop listening. So you can say, I echo those demands that I know you've already heard 20 times. And I want to add this additional information. So when I showed up at a pretty crucial council meeting this summer, I had organized with 12 other people we were speaking about the same things, we were demanding the same things, but each of us chose a different part of that topic to speak on so we could present as much information as possible instead of repeating the same information over and over again. And I felt like this was a very powerful tactic. Um, as far as the nitty gritty of public speaking goes, I think in this time with the pandemic, you almost have an advantage because you can be in the comfort of your own home and you can kind of set yourself up for success. Sometimes that means like eating a good meal, having a nice big glass of water next to you, 
for me, I like to keep a picture of someone I really love and respect close to me. And I'll just talk to that picture because talking to the council people like they're assholes that you hate tends not to get the message across. Giving everyone the benefit of the doubt that they actually care about humanity and that's and they care about the planet and maybe that's why they're on the council and speaking to them from a place of respect is can be much, much more effective. Now, I also just want to acknowledge that that tone and that choice of tone is a privilege. I personally have not been oppressed by our system. I mean, as a woman, I have, but um, I can come into these conversations with political officials calmly, and I don't have as much anger or generational trauma. Not everyone can speak from that perspective. Some people need to scream. Some people need to yell. And I honor and respect that as a way of communicating. Um, but as all white people in this, in this conversation right now, we have the ability to usually speak the language and with the tone of the people that are making decisions. And it's our job to use that privilege to be heard and to help elevate the voices of other people who are not going to be heard or who are going to be easily written off as angry or um you know screamers i hear that a lot from our council here they're like well you can't yell at me or i you need to use a calm tone of voice or i'm not going to listen if people are screaming at me which i can honor that nobody wants to get screamed at but as people of privilege people that are white i think it's also our job to to speak in a way where the council can hear us because we have that ability and to say, you know, to speak up for people who might get cast aside, who might get written off. Um, and I suppose that's more of my personal agenda than necessarily a public speaking tip, but um, I don't know. I always think about that when I am speaking to the council people. Another thing I like to do as far as like being effective and actually making change happen is I always, at the end of my speaking, at the end of my comment, I'll say, I would really appreciate it, appreciate it if you would address my concerns in this meeting and tell me what you're thinking and what you plan to do. Because sometimes they have so much comment, so much public comment that they'll just not say anything after the public comment because they're so tired or they're, they don't even know how to process it all. But asking for what you want to hear because sometimes they will not even respond to your comment. So, you know, I want to know, council, like Mayor Venice, what do you plan to do about this? And not in a way that's angry or mean, but just give them a chance to respond and ask that they respond. And if you don't hear a response, I tend to be one for follow-up emails. I send a lot of emails to my council people. I say, I was at this meeting, 20 people asked you to stop sweeping homeless camps. You guys didn't say anything about it. What do you think about this? What do you plan to do about it? I'm listening, I'm paying attention. So yeah, those are kind of my keys. Definitely practicing with friends beforehand or practicing in a mirror or record yourself and play it back and, and see what you think about your testimony and how it came across to you. Um, those are all really good tips for public speaking. Clearly, always take a deep breath. I think the the tendency when you're speaking, when it actually comes to speaking to the public and not just practicing, is to just rush through it, to go, have your head down, say it really quickly, so the more you can take a breath and slow it down, the better usually. Don't try and cram as much as you can into your three minute testimony as possible. You know, look through it, read through it and think about what the key points are and say them clearly and project them instead of being like, so you did this, you did this. And I also know that you did this. And on the 3rd of July, I saw this happen and I want you guys to change this. And if you would please, you know, it's great to have a concrete example of something that you don't want to see happen. And it's great to have a concrete solution of what you do want to see happen. And then a, a, an ask, please, will you respond to me? Did you hear me? Um, something that I tend to do that I sometimes get made fun of it for is when I show up and I start doing giving public testimony, I'll say, please listen. <laughs> 
it seems effective. It's a little thing, but sometimes they'll have their head down and it's comment after comment and after comment and just asking them to wake up. Please listen to me. I, I really care about this and I'm not going anywhere. And I think that consistency, I mean, if you guys showed up here and you're part of this organization, you clearly are dedicated to this and willing to give it your time and energy. So I'll say that the more you show up at these council meetings, the more you'll be heard if you're speaking from a place of respect. If you show up and yell and yell and yell and yell, it's easy to write you be written off. And I unfortunately see that happening to some of our civilians here in Eugene, where they come to the meetings with a lot of anger and passion. And sometimes the council won't even give them a chance to speak. And that's also against the law. But I see, I've been seeing it happen. Um, I would love to answer any questions. And I was going to share something that I've been working on with you guys too. Um, my friend Corey and I have been making these city council baseball cards uh, to distribute around Eugene because we want people to feel that it is accessible to speak to our counselors and it is easy to know who they are. And we thought this um, these playing cards would kind of help gamify in a way the council and make it feel more approachable. You can look through and be like, oh, this is my ward's council person. And then on the back, it says, what do they care about? What subcommittees they're on? It has a quote. So you can kind of get a feel for who these people are um, without having to invest so much time and energy. And then you're like, oh, I could show up and talk to these people. Um, so I don't know if I can do a little screen share and share those, and then we could do like question and answer. You should be able to share now. Okay, great. All right. Oh, well, how do, where did, sorry, I'm trying to get over to, if it's not what I want. There we go. So here we go. This is our mayor, Lucy Venice. So she's got her little playing card. We drew a picture, you know, and then on the back of the card, it has, okay, this is her email address. This is how long she's been serving as mayor. This is what she did beforehand. Subcommittee she's on. What are her priorities? What does she care about? And then in the middle has big moves. Like what has she done for the town? And then did you know a little fun fact? Um, and then a quote at the end. So this kind of gives you a little bit of context for who are these people and what do they care about? You know, oh, here's Greg Evans. What does he care about? You know, so we just made, you know, one for each council person, one for the mayor, one for the chief of police. And we're just going to print and distribute these. So it's always good to try and come up with fun ways to engage because this, this work can be really discouraging. This work can be really hard. So for me, I think it's been more about finding out how I can sustain my pace of activism because this, these fights are not gonna be won overnight and they're not gonna be won in one council meeting. The, the longer, the more we can set a pace that we can keep up with, um, I almost think of it like a chronic and acute active activism so acute activism would be like okay george floyd was murdered this summer everybody showed up to protest it was a very specific moment in time to fight for social justice and then chronic activism is like oh i'm here for years i'm here at every council meeting or every other council meeting you know whatever sustainable for you and i'm speaking up about this this you know i'm speaking up about social justice and racial equity and it's it's gonna happen. And I, I suppose chronic and acute is more like how you would describe a sickness, but perhaps I've caught the activist bug uh, chronically. But finding ways that you can still find joy in it and make it beautiful because at the end of the day, the work we're doing is because we really care about something and we really love something. And centering that in our work is what make, gives it breath. And it's refreshing to policymakers too, because we're coming from a place of love, of passion. Um, I think that can be really easy to lose sight of because there's so much to be angry and upset about. So as much as we can try, and that's why I like keep someone a picture of somebody I love. For me, it's my grandmother who died 
you know, she was so strong and so powerful. So when I speak, like I'm speaking to her, I think that my message comes across with more love and, it, and then it's heard more or it resonates in a different way with people, which is kind of me being a cheesy hippie, but, um, yeah, that's kind of my spiel a little bit, but I'm happy to answer questions. If people have specific things they struggle with, with public speaking, or questions for me at all? Gracie, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I really just wanna just thank you. I got so much out of that. And I had a question initially, but I think you answered it. Um, one of the things that I really struggle with when I was giving public testimony is I care so much and I don't have a poker face. I get really emotional, my face turns red you know, I start talking really fast. And what you said today just completely shifted that vibration for me that if I can, if I can look at it as coming, not, not, I'm not giving testimony for myself. This isn't my issue. This isn't about me. I'm doing this on behalf of others who don't have a voice for people that, you know, may not be able to speak up for, because, you know, the white privilege that you talked about is something that we've been addressing at Surfrider especially in our book club about, um, you know, really understanding that piece of it. And so when I, when I can think that, you know, I'm not, this isn't about me or my agenda, this is, I'm, I'm doing this on behalf of, of, of others, then the emotion, like I have more detachment. Does that make sense? So yeah. I feel like it's just you saying that shifted something for me that I, I, I feel like I'll be able to get more detachment if I'm not coming at it from this is what I want and I'm sick of seeing microplastic on the beach and, you know, um, that type of thing. It's So I really appreciated that. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this or not. Just one question I have is I'm, I'm really energetically sensitive. And so sometimes like being in those courtrooms feels or, you know, the city hall feels really toxic for me and like I don't know do you have you experienced that and how do you handle that yeah I'm crazy empathic right. I I just like yeah I have to like purge yes. other people's energy constantly um so I would say I'm gonna have some hippy dippy solutions for this and you take it or leave it that's um, what I'm hoping for I carry obsidian with me. Um, so I, I carry like Chris, powerful crystals or tourmaline, black tourmaline is another really powerful rock that can help protect your energy and keep other people's energies out of your, out of your energy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, good. So that's one thing. Okay. Um, and then I would say like what we just talked about and what you said, what resonated with you as much as you can like keep that in, in, in your heart and in your mind in the present moment, it kind of makes all of the other energy kind of shed off of you like a duck because your mission is so clear and it's about so much more than you. Um, and I think keeping like a totem or something that reminds you of like all of the other people who couldn't be in that room, who couldn't speak up, who can't be heard, um, will help you find strength and grounding and what it is your message is, um, which is really powerful. And I would also say that like your emotions and like expressing them is an incredible gift. Um, and it's, it's allowing to be, have the perspective, like to step back, to not exist in them. Like my therapist always says, like your emotions are like a kite and you can either be the, the kite in the wind, or you can be the person holding the string. And so I picture that as like your emotions are a huge gift and they're gonna be important in how you public speak, but it's important that you are in the forefront, not your emotions, and that you're able to utilize them to speak more clearly, more passionately, more directly, instead of letting them take your words and run with them and fluster you or, you know, to stand back from them. And that's easier said than done you know, and it comes with practice. But I think like if something in you like really resonated with what I said about privilege, like carrying something to remind you of that, even like wearing a necklace or something that you have close to your heart to remind you of what you're doing and why you're doing it, you'll speak with a confidence and a power that will be undeniable. 
I just want to jump in here because I was hoping, Dia, you were going to be here for this session because I actually, you know, from sitting in the audience when you're giving testimony, you feel like your testimony is so powerful because of that emotion. Um, thinking about the bag ban when we had tons of people giving testimony, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of emotion. You know, people were really drawn in by the youth giving testimony. But when you got up to speak, the room was listening because of that emotion that you were showing. Other people weren't really showing that. So um, for me, as an observer listening to your testimony, I felt like you really were drawing the room in because you were displaying that emotion and kind of showing that vulnerability and, and how important the issue is to you. So that's my observation from hearing you uh, give public testimony a few times. Thank you so much. Part of my issue is, as I am an empath, you know, like Gracie, and I also sometimes channel the rage and the outrage of ancestral, like the collective conscious of women who've been, you know, brutalized and oppressed. And so I feel all of that. And so to contain that, you know, people that are, our indigenous, you know, ancestors, and I just, I hold that. And so I just, I really thank you. And I'd love to get your contact information just to somebody that, you know, I could, um, you know, chat to every now and then. Um, and I thank you, thank you, Brie, for what you said. Thank you. Yeah, and I would say, you know, never aim for detachment because I think that you don't need to, to detach from your emotion because if you're like me and you're empathic, that emotion is also where your power resides. So don't, don't leave it behind or disregard it. It's really powerful and important. It's just knowing how to, to hold it and hold space for it. Jean? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Gracie. I got, uh, of course, I know there'll be a, like a video later, but I, I got so many notes and you touched me in so many ways. And um, um, I mean, with lots of super practical things and I can kind of go on. I mean, everything from, you know, having a concrete example of what you, what you want, what you do want and what you don't want so that it's really clear. Uh, but I think the biggest part, and it connects with what uh, Dia, you know, this con this last part of this interaction, uh, speaking from our hearts, that really is, and that the you said the thing about having the picture of your grandmother, you know, having the picture of somebody you love several times, but I didn't write it down, didn't type it down until the third time you said it because I, I really got it that third time, like I really got it that. Um, uh, I mean, we are here. I mean, you know, we are here for everybody else and the other creatures and everything. And, and that heart, that heart's where it needs to come. And I'm going to rip off your base. I think I'm going to rip off your baseball card idea uh, because I'm at such a loss like today trying to do with this. Uh, uh, I was a bit late. I was working on this uh, this SC, SRC 17 or whatever it is that's happening, you know, now uh, getting the comments out about that, You're trying to say, you know, can I get five people to write in comments? And, um, um, you know, just feeling like, hey, you know, how do I reach, how do I reach these people? Uh, how are elected officials and they are people they are humans and we we need to see them and the personalizing of them be it um uh you know on the baseball card idea or any way that we can see them as people you know see them as somebody who could you know sit down and you know have a glass of, have a cup of tea with or something uh they're not our enemies they're not our enemies they are there because they're serving, mm -hmm. but they need our input. They yeah, they're, work, they're working for us. They're working for us. And that's an important thing to remember too. That is their job to work for the people. 
I also like there was a thing you said too about the difference between organizing versus mobilizing. That's also really key. So I'd like some more to go in, in that. So you can take note of that, uh, Bree and Anna. And I'll just, I'll just stop there. Um, yeah, and I would say one other thing like that Jean McAlevey says about organizing versus mobilizing. She says every time she hires a good, a good organizer, what she's looking for is someone who genuinely believes in the good of people, who genuinely likes people, because they're the people that are going to be able to engage people that don't feel the same way about things as them to approach an issue from a need rather from like a political standpoint of like, what do you need as a person? What does the planet need? Not like I am right wing, I am left wing, like, but to, to, to approach other people as humans that you guys have inherently, that we all have inherently the same needs and to come from that place and a place of loving people, um, that is what leads to effective organizing. And anybody who so identifies with their political stance that they stop seeing other people as people is going to be much less effective. And that's something that I've been witnessing in our country in a really devastating way is more than like being afraid of people who are conservative or people who are liberal or any of that. I'm afraid of the division that's being perpetuated. I'm afraid that we're, we're paying attention to such different information sources that pit us against each other when the real enemy is like the hyper wealthy and huge corporations. And we think that the other side is our enemy and we can never fight the right fight if we're fighting each other. I don't know. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. I've, I've often wished that we could just get like people, because I see this so much division, you know, in, in the area where I live too. And um, it's not as outward as it is just a, a tension, like an energetic tension. And I just wish we could get everybody in the same room and just talk to one another and find out what it is that you love, what it is, what it is that brings you joy, what, well, let's work together to make sure that everybody has access to that, that we are taking care of our ocean, that we are, you know, for the fishing industry and I just feel like if we could just, I wish there was like a way we could have some kind of a, like a gathering where people could just talk to one another, you know, hear each other, listen. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that so my job and my work is that I have a cooking school and I teach cooking classes. And I really believe that food and like sharing a dinner table is what is going to bring us together and sharing our food traditions with each other is what's going to unite us and that like when we're sitting down and eating together and cooking together, there is a humanity about that that is, is undeniable, no matter what somebody else, you know, what car they drove in on or bike or rollerblades, like we're gonna sit and eat together and that is super powerful. So I do think food is a crucial piece of how do we get people together? How do we get them to sit down? Feed them, show, show up with some food. <laughs> I love that. I also just bringing together a few of the elements from questions that you were just talking about, you know, we're talking about testimony here, which is sort of speaking to the elected officials at the decision point. And then as Gracie was saying, following up, if they're not answering your questions, but what we've been talking about in our earlier trainings is connecting with your elected officials whenever you feel like it. Um, invite them to do a beach cleanup with you, whether it's organized or it's just you going for a beach walk. Um, finding out, I loved when Gracie was talking about finding out more about your counselors, elected officials. It's, it's easier on the local level. Uh, a lot of you probably actually know at least one of your city counselors, but, um, you know, did your city counselors just get a new dog. Do you have a dog? Can you connect about that? Um, there's a lot of those, those human elements that we can connect about. And when you're talking about council decisions, you can still reach out to them before the decision point when they're just considering it and ask, you know, I don't understand this part of what you're talking about. Can, do you have time that we can grab a coffee and talk about it or correspond over email? Um, so you can still kind of connect with them 
at any time, not just these key sort of decision points like a public hearing. Uh, and I also just thank you so much, Gracie. Um, this is a really, really wonderful session and I hope we can all have a meal together at some point soon. Oh. And I love that that sort of final thought of bringing people together around food. Yeah, it was, a, it was a privilege to join you guys. Thank you so much for asking me to come, Anna. Yeah, I'm so glad you could make it today. I learned so much and I just like had chills most of the time. It was so inspiring and such a beautiful way to look at how we as citizens can keep, keep uh, our chronic activism going. Yeah, and I think it's hard not to get discouraged when you see policymakers not making the choices that you're fighting for. So yeah, remember the joy and re remember to keep the pace. Mm -hmm. The fight is long. <laughs> you need a little superhero avatar. You're so cute. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's just, <laughs> you're like my new superhero. <laughs> oh gosh, come on. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> this was so great. So thank you all for joining and I will try and get this up on the blog within the next few days because I think this will be a great video and, and blog to send around to other people who weren't able to be here today. I think this will be so useful to our community and beyond. So and thank you guys all for doing the work that you're doing. I really appreciate and respect you guys for your work. Great. All right. Likewise. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Anna. These are amazing. And I've looked at your at some of your blog posts. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you've got the information right up there. They're they're wonderful. Thank you. Oh, so thank can you. I share um uh can I just like share those in Facebook? Like yeah. in our, in our, okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was okay. just thinking yesterday, like, oh, yeah, I could be putting links in Facebook to all of them. So, yeah, feel free to share them because, you know, originally I had really wanted to open these up to big audiences. But uh, Brie reminded me that there really is the threat of Zoom bombers who can derail things. Mm -hmm. But I think once they're recorded, like this information should be shared. It's so useful and inspiring. So, yeah, I think I think I'm going to invite a friend of mine who is I don't. I don't know if she's a surf rider member, but when I call her up, she, I mean, she is at those city council meetings mm -hmm. fighting and online uh, fighting against LNG and not just in her town, but our town too. And, uh, you know, the online ones and has reminded me about stuff. And she, I think she would get so much from particularly from the heart of all of this, that it would nourish her. Oh yeah. Uh, so I think I want to invite her. Yes, please do. Please do. I think, you know, extending the invite to people to join is great or sending okay. them a video after either one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for joining. Bye. Bye.